Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, Gary, if there's a way to get a thumbs up from you to make sure that I am sound proof here for the team. Loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Well, welcome everyone this afternoon. Uh, I am Rachel Leslie. I serve as president of the National Defense Industrial Association of Indiana, and I am joined here today with a uh, a lot of members actually of the NDIA advisory board. So thank you for joining us as well. In addition, I'm joined today by Gary Flegel, who serves as um, the executive vice president and COO for the National Center for Defense Manufacturing and Machining. So Gary, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are proud to be able to put this three part series on along with the NCDMM and are happy that it looks like um, around 35 to 40 individuals here in Indiana were able to join us this afternoon. So on behalf of NDIA, I wanna welcome all of you. Gary, would you like to give uh, your warm welcome this afternoon? Absolutely, thank you, Rachel. Um, we're very pleased to partner with the Indiana chapter of NDIA. Uh, NCDMM is a national collaboration uh, effort that uh, transitions technology to the defense industrial base uh, we also operate America Makes, which is the Additive Manufacturing Institute, uh, the first of the Manufacturing USA Institutes. And uh, Rachel told you my day job. One of my other jobs is I am vice chair of the NDIA Manufacturing Division, uh, and we were chairman come October. So uh, Rachel and I got together and thought, wouldn't it be great if we could get a, a, the divisions of NDIA and a, and a chapter in Indiana working together? To kind of share resources and, and we came up with this webinar series. So this is the first uh, effort. I welcome all of you. Um, and as a uh, note from a housekeeping standpoint, you should all see the Q&A button on the right hand side of your screen. Um, so as the presenters go through uh, their presentations, if you have questions, you can uh, type them in there and then at the appropriate time, we'll uh, provide questions to the presenters and have a kind of a back and forth Q&A as well as a presentation. So um, thank you for your patience in this uh, air quality the term, but new normal of webinars. Um, but it's great to see so many people on and hopefully you uh, find some value in this. Uh, and we look forward to continuing partnering uh, between NCMM, the manufacturing division and the Indiana chapter. So uh, I get to introduce our first set of speakers. There's actually two. They're going to do round robin. Um, they're from the University of Alabama Huntsville, UAH, and UAH is renowned for their efforts in supply chain management, in large part um, due to uh, the two gentlemen that are joining us today. The first is Mr. Joe Paxton. He is the director of the Office for Operational Excellence at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Uh, Joe has a background, uh, diverse background, developing, instructing, and applying continuous improvement principles as well as optimizing supply chain, which is why he's here today with us. He has over 25 years commercial and government experience, uh, including supporting the DOD and the DOD supply chain in mapping supply chains, managing supply chain risk, integrated advanced manufacturing. Uh, Joe holds a master's degree in industrial systems engineering, is a Six Sigma black belt, and is a certified supply chain operations reference professional. So joining Joe, is Mr. Brian Tucker, and he's a principal research scientist in the Office for Operational Excellence at UAH. Uh, Brian is also a Lean Six Sigma Black Belt and Certified Supply Chain Operations Reference. Uh, Brian has worked extensively with the DOD and the DOD Industrial Base, uh, working with the U.S. Army Material Command, uh, AMCOM, now it is CCDC AVMC, which most of us used to know as AMRDEC, uh, the Missile Defense Agency, DLA, and the list goes on and on. He also has a ton of effort uh, in supply chain mapping and model modeling, supply chain risk, uh, industrial-based research, and the list goes on and on. Brian has an undergrad and a master's degree in industrial and systems engineering from UAH. So as you've heard, they've done extensive supply chain modeling and mapping um, <clears throat> for a variety of our DOD uh, entities, as well as uh, Redstone Arsenal. They're a great resource, great partners, and all around great guys. So please join me in welcoming Joe and Brian to the stage. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Thank you, Gary. Can everybody hear me and see my screen okay? 
We can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having us and uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, Gary, thank you for the introduction and uh, we'll get, get started. As Gary mentioned, uh, Brian and I are both with the University of Alabama in Huntsville in the Office for Operational Excellence. Um, we've got a um, pretty extensive history with the university, not us with the university, but the university does with um, supporting the Department of Defense and uh, involved in that a lot of supply chain work. Um, and much of the experience that we have is with the Army, uh, just being in the area that we're in and much of our experience with the Army has been with Army Aviation. So what we'd like to share today is our perspective on the DOD supply chain and the, you know, kind of how it's evolved over the uh, recent past and, and what we think it's going to look like going into the future from that perspective. Um, there's certainly a lot of challenges that the DOD supply chain has when you compare it to uh, the supply chain of for consumer products, for example. Um, typically with consumer products, a lot of the supply chain challenges are from the manufacturer downstream and getting that product to the end user uh, in the DOD world. A lot of that challenge is from the prime or the OEM and looking upstream and making sure they have the materials and parts needed to produce whatever system they're producing. Um, so having said that, uh, you know, pretty much everything we're going to be talking about is is DOD supply chain related, but a lot of this, a lot of the challenges and uh, perspectives that we're going to share also apply to the commercial world as well. So if we just take the um, term DOD supply chain, it can mean a lot of things and, and it encompasses uh, many areas and topics. Uh, for example, the different tiers of the supply chain, uh, government regulations, flow down requirements to subcontractors, intellectual property, visibility of lower tiers, advanced manufacturing, uh, workforce capabilities and skills, uh, cyber and physical security and so on. Um, so there's there's a lot of stuff that could cut that, that we could talk about. We picked some of the more major topics uh, that we can uh, share with you today. Some, some again, our perspective on that, um, and some of those will relate to the supply chain as a whole, and and some will relate to the suppliers that make up the supply chain or some of those industrial partners that make that up. I want to start uh, real quick and just kind of kind of take a look at what the supply chain environment looks like today. Um, there's there's different characteristics of the DOD supply chain, things that make uh, can make it challenging to participate in it. Uh, one of those is, uh, which is not specific to DOD, but just the supply chain and logistics costs themselves. We've seen that change over over a number of years, and it continues to uh, increase to be a larger and larger percentage of total cost of goods sold, if you will, um, at some some of the industries in the 50 to 80 percent range of sales. Uh, so having having that large percentage of cost kind of draws a lot of attention to how do we reduce it. Uh, a couple of uh, statistics for you, the food industry, for example, runs around 60 percent cost of sales. Uh, papers, 55 percent, petroleum, 79 percent. Uh, automotive industry is about 67 percent. We actually did some work with the uh, automotive assembly plant uh, close to us, and uh, it was such a such a large expense that they said their transportation costs alone were more than their labor costs in the plant. So they're spending more to get parts to and from the plant than they are on the people that work in the plant. So it's a it's a big opportunity, let's say. Uh, supply chains also are becoming more and more complex and global. Uh, they're, they're certainly international, which brings about challenges with language uh, barriers, uh, time zone differences, transportation time, different cultures in different countries. Uh, some of those countries may be non-friendly, uh, creating some challenges there. Uh, also, they're, they can be very complex. If we look at, uh, especially in the DOD world, there are um, companies that play the role of prime contractor uh, in one supply chain. Uh, they may be a subcontractor in another supply chain. They may be both uh, in a supply chain. And the supply chains are getting pretty large too. We've mapped out quite a few uh, supply chains for uh, Army Aviation Systems. And just to give you an example, if we take a, a vertical shaft for one of the popular helicopter platforms, just the vertical shaft alone has 23 first-tier suppliers. And if you take that and expand it across the system, 
they can get very large very fast um, and, and difficult to manage. Uh, another characteristic of, of things today is these supply chains, large supply chains are intended to and often do operate as an enterprise themselves. It's like a giant company with a lot of different divisions. Uh, one challenge though is, is those companies, individual nodes of the supply chain are uh, measured individually Everybody needs to make a profit and, and that and reduce inventory and things like that. So that can lead to uh, sub optimized um, performance of the supply chain as a whole. Um, which, which brings about the opportunity for uh, having proper metrics in place to measure performance of the supply chain and drive the right behavior. Uh, the typically supply chains are measured with what I'll call reactive metrics uh, being cost on time delivery quality. Those are absolutely important. Uh, but they measure things that have already happened. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to look at things from a more strategic standpoint as well, where we look at what practices uh, do the different suppliers have in place? Do they have continuous improvement culture? Uh, do suppliers know what their critical parts are? Do they know who the suppliers of them are? Um, are they watching those a little bit closer than things you might be able to get alternative suppliers for quickly? Um, is the supply chain inventory being monitored as a whole, as opposed to at different points? Um, and, and at the same time, all that sounds great, but at the same time, there's no one entity that would claim responsibility for the entire supply chain. So it makes that quite difficult to do. Another, another uh, characteristic is trans, uh, supply chains transform throughout their life cycle. I'll talk more about this in a minute, but um, the supply chain itself changes form it, it, it at the beginning of the life cycle. It's, you know, forming based on the design of the system. It evolves to a full blown full production supply chain and then may taper off to something to support operation and sustainment. And throughout that life cycle, you know, we expect the supply chain to operate differently. And there's some, some other considerations there. We'll talk about in a minute. So having said all that, that's kind of the picture of, of the environment today um, and. Uh, an NDIA uh, report came out earlier this year that graded the the um, um, defense industrial base, and we got a grade, we got a, a C, which I don't think anybody would be happy with. Some of the things that were that were looked into there were security, innovation, cash flow, inventory, um, and political and regulatory uh, factors, things like public opinion, acquisition, red tape, that sort of thing, and we're just not performing the way that. That we would like to, so it is very challenging. We're doing a, a an okay job at it. Uh, certainly, room for improvement. So, if I, if we take a minute and and dive in a little bit into the supply chains, and um, you know, our perspective is that they they change over time with the life cycle. So, if we take the life cycle of a weapon system, for example, uh, when it's being conceptualized and designed. Just some of the decisions that you would make um, early in that life cycle might lock you into certain suppliers. For example, if we have a uh, a system that requires a large composite structure, um, this isn't necessarily DOD, but say for example the uh, space launch system, NASA space launch system, um, it's a what about a 30 foot in diameter uh, vehicle launch vehicle. And if we had a composite structure that large, there's only a few suppliers in the world that can, you know, create and cure composites that big. So just by having that that concept, we're already locked into some suppliers, and that can be the same case with um, specialty materials or particular manufacturing operations that only a few companies have. So that supply chain kind of starts to take form early in the life cycle. As the life cycle changes, things change. Economy, the economic condition changes. Uh, demand will certainly go up as we get into production. Uh, spares and support demand is non-existent in the beginning, but then when we get into operation, it's a statement. It's the it's the lifeblood of the of the system. Um, so as we look at how that changes uh, into full rate production, for example, the prime suppliers uh, start making some of the sourcing decisions as opposed to when we were in a prototype phase. Um, there's there's a need to flow down uh, regulatory requirements. Um, visibility of the lower tiers becomes more important. Um, if we can't see the, who those suppliers are, we're accepting uh, possibly a large risks. Um, it's it's the point when we want the supply chain performance to be in a line so it can operate like a, a good mach well oiled machine. Um, 
and there's also uh, during that time there may be limited resources deeper in the supply chain, and we may have programs within one branch, for example, or across branches across the DoD that compete for the same resources and do it unknowingly. Um, so there's there's things that can go on there as well. As we as we progress into operation and sustainment, we start sourcing things a little bit differently. The actual sourcing organization may change. Uh, we may go from a um, for example, uh, Army sourcing parts for a helicopter to shifting that over to the Defense Logistics Agency. Well, DLA has a different sourcing philosophy, different processes, um, may or may not try to leverage a different supply base, and that, that can uh, kind of change how the supply chain works as well, too. Uh, we start looking also at uh, how inventory is managed because we don't want to sit on too much if we're going into the final phases of the life cycle. Um, do we continue to replenish what we use? Are suppliers starting to uh, end support for programs? Do we need to execute a lifetime buy and things like that? And also, um, as we get into operation and sustainment, the need to often look for alternative suppliers, we run into this challenge with intellectual property rights where the people that designed and built the original parts may own the rights uh, and but may have limited capacity or whatever the case may be that would drive us to look for alternate suppliers. But then it's hard to do that because we don't have the rights to the technical data or don't have the technical data to uh, put out on bid, um, which kind of leads us into our uh, next topic I wanted to cover, intellectual property. There's two perspectives here. One is the government perspective where uh, the vendor controls the intellectual property. Uh, they may feel like it's not available to the government to be able to uh, compete parts, so it ends up being uh, more costly and difficult to um, maintain systems, uh, can can cause delays in keeping systems operational. Uh, then there's the industry perspective where they would look at it as, you know, we've invested a lot of time in the capabilities that we have, some of the special processes and designs and things, and we don't want that to just disappear. That's a, that's a competitive advantage. So it's that's being recognized. There's been some legislation and a couple of uh, um, documents and, and instructions that have come out recently in the past year or two that are starting to address that. One example is uh, Army Directive 2018-26, uh, where uh, intellectual property as is certainly recognized as a key enabler for Army modernization priorities, um, and also recognizes the need to balance that fostering of innovation, the protection of the industrial base with the long-term sustainment and keeping the keeping the cost down. So the thought there is to identify early in the life cycle what intellectual property is needed and acquire that at that time, uh, as opposed to get into a predicament where we can't get it or we have to pay a lot to uh, get the rights to it, um, identify what's needed and only what's needed early and work those problems out uh, early in the life cycle. On a broader scale, there's a DOD instruction, uh, 5010.44 that came out uh, October of last year uh, that establishes a policy and assigns some responsibilities uh, regarding acquisition licensing and management of intellectual property. It actually goes to the extent of establishing a DOD IP cadre uh, to develop and facilitate a consistent approach across the DOD. And you know, for you that have, uh, are involved in DOD, having anything consistent across DOD is uh, is rare. Uh, so it's 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 great to see that opportunity. It's certainly recognized that um, there needs to be a protection of IP and, and industry to foster that innovation, like I mentioned, uh, but also have access to it as needed um, to maintain these systems. And then lays out some. Uh, responsibilities of individuals, including the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition uh, as the senior official overseeing that. Um, so there's, th these are great things that are, that are forming right now that will hopefully help avoid these problems for future systems, uh, but they don't necessarily solve the problems for systems that have been in place, the legacy systems. And some of those have been in place for a long time. We've got a picture of the B-52 here that's been, been around longer than me. And, uh, is, is projected to continue to fly uh, probably for decades to come and other systems that are similar to that that will be around for a while. So there's still that challenge with legacy systems, but hopefully 
uh, things are starting to shift in the IP world. Another, another obstacle is supply chain visibility or lack of visibility uh, more often than not. Um, there's a, a Chartered Institute of Procurement Supply reported in 2016 that only 4% of companies actually know their tier two and tier three suppliers. And we've got supply chains that are maybe five, 10 different layers deep uh, or deeper. Uh, and only being able to see one or two layers is is really um, visually impairing as far as the supply chain goes. Um, and, and not having that visibility can certainly lead to a lot of problems. It can, uh, if there's any kind of disruptions, we're all experiencing now uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and it certainly had taken its toll on uh, many supply chains. Um, but we we don't know until we start feeling some of the impact of that what the extent is and not having that visibility really delays that really delays that visibility the feeling that feeling that impact there could be other things too natural disasters um, anywhere in the world a supplier could close uh, labor strikes uh, looking at the Long Beach um, strike for example we start to see th things happen and then later in time we start to feel the effect of it and then it takes even longer to do something about it. Knowledge of foreign dependencies uh, for DOD suppliers, also uh, visibility of supply chain weaknesses and single point failures. Uh, where in our supply chains do we have uh, suppliers that are common across many different systems? Uh, a supplier, for example, of some kind of specialty material uh, that if something happened there, it could it could negatively impact a, a very broad range of, of systems and um, ultimately can impact the, the lives of our war fighters. Um, informed recommendations in response to congressional data calls. So if we have uh, Congress is, is monitoring uh, foreign interest in a, in a U.S. company where they may want to invest in or, or buy a domestic company, uh, can, is the information available to actually know what that would impact? Uh, if we don't have the visibility, it's not. Um, and then as, as manufacturing sources and materials uh, shortages start to occur, it takes longer for us to respond to them. So some of the events looking at the bottom left of the chart that have impacted supply chains from 2013 to 2018, you can look at those. Uh, many of those are natural disasters, and that's certainly not something that we can necessarily predict or prevent, uh, but we can do things like uh, know who our key suppliers are, know where they are, and have uh, be able to respond faster and maybe have some mitigation and uh, plans in place that can be executed uh, quicker uh, to prevent minimal or prevent uh, more impact on the supply chain and, and and on the weapon systems themselves. So some of the things that um, are currently going on paths to improve improved and visi improved visibility. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there that the government has uh, funded to develop uh, to capture supply chain data. Uh, most of the ones we've seen are uh, either within a system, a weapon system project office, or within a um, part of an agency or most uh, limited to an agency. Uh, very few of those uh, cross, the, cross the borders of those programs or agencies. Um, they're also often difficult to maintain because they're mostly dependent on manually collecting data in the supply chain. Uh, and, you know, just having the resources to be able to do that uh, makes it difficult and data does have a shelf life uh, so it can expire and not just you, you run the risk of not knowing what the data is, but you may also have data that's wrong. There's also commercial programs out there done in Bradstreet um, uh, provides a lot of risk data on suppliers in, in many industries. There's some other ones that we're aware of, Interos, Exeger, Prime Supplier is more NASA related um, that are out there. Uh, many of those are limited to supplier risk and not supply chain risk. So they look more at individual company risk uh, and, and have challenges to roll that up into a supply chain as a whole. And the reason is a lot of the commercial companies don't know what the, what the supply chains look like. Um, so they there are some really, really interesting capabilities though, where uh, they can crawl the web and look for relationships between companies, not necessarily that this company is a supplier for this one for this system, but we know that these two companies are related. 
so you can kind of speculate that there's some uh, some relationship there and help um, quantify some risk that way. Um, and then there's also the challenge there with commercial systems of just directly connecting those to the government systems to get that that whatever supply chain structure is known. It's risky to uh, do that. And there's also um, things that are happening now to put more contractual data requirements into for suppliers to report who their sub tier suppliers are. Uh, sometimes there's some pushback there because some of those lower tier suppliers may be a competitive advantage uh, for the higher tier ones and they don't want to share that information. Um, but those are some things that are currently being done that we've seen. Um, advanced manufacturing is a, is a certainly a quickly evolving topic as well too that is both driven by and impacts the DOD supply chain. Um, there's a clear shift I think in manufacturing uh, toward advanced manufacturing technologies and capabilities that spans many industries, not just defense. If we think about some of the products we use today, our phones, our our cars, uh, so many products now we've got refrigerators that can keep up with what groceries we need and tell us when to buy more eggs, for example. Um, they're very complex, very uh, highly technical, technically capable, um, but that drives us toward developing and, and having the ability to manufacture these things. And the DOD world is no exception to that. Some of the some of the um, drivers in the DOD world that are pushing for advanced manufacturing techniques are the complexity, the designs, the uh, advanced materials that are being used. Um, many of our systems uh, need variable configurations or at least um, different options for different missions, um, increasing performance requirements, um, and then being able to integrate systems. If we look at um, uh, the missile defense system now, it's it's a lot of different systems put together, individual uh, systems that can operate on their own that actually are, are being integrated to work together. In uh, advanced manufacturing is so key that in the 2019 Army Modernization Strategy, it was acknowledged as a key enabler to develop the next generation of weapon systems. So there's there's certainly a drive by DOD to further advance manufacturing um, but at the same time, industry is adopting it uh, because there's benefits there, regardless of, of the of the demands of the end product. Uh, some examples are uh, beyond the cap just manufacturing capability, but also uh, including uh, efficiency, lower production costs, um, being able to produce things uh, faster, and improve the quality of the products that are made. And those benefits are driving companies to invest in. Uh, advanced manufacturing to give them a um, more competitive advantage uh, in many cases, just open up new business growth opportunities and improve efficiencies. Uh, but there's still companies that are uh, resistant to investing in advanced manufacturing. Um, it can be expensive. Um, they may not uh, be able to justify or, or uh, even fully calculate what the return on investment is. There's more technical skills that are required. Brian's going to talk about that shortly, um, and, or may just not be consistent with the current business practice that they have. But um, we're seeing seeing advanced manufacturing certainly grow, and um, both driven and benefited uh, by the DoD. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian, and um, we'll continue on. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just hope you guys can hear me okay. Gotcha. Okay, great. So, um, similar to what Joe was mentioning, in advanced manufacturing, another area that is um, has evolved over the the recent past is uh, this concept of uh, Industry 4.0 with the advances in computing power, uh, storage and bandwidth, Internet of Things, advanced analytics, and then um, the evolution of digital technologies. Um, manufacturing has been able to take advantage of this, and from you know, manufacturing standpoint, uh, we can look at digital manufacturing as the, the application of these digital technologies as a means to plan, assess, and operate the, the overall manufacturing system. So you can think about that from uh, beginning at planning, uh, creating digital models. Those models can be used in even developing uh, cost estimates for material labor, creating a digital twin of the, of the part to be used later in the manufacturing process as a build file or for uh, testing later. And um, this collaboration of design for manufacturability that can happen between supply chain partners. 
Uh, from an operation standpoint, you can utilize those models to again to build the production files to um, and utilize digital technologies to do this in situ or in process monitoring uh, of the of the process itself. So you can make decisions sort of real time on how things are are performing in in the process. And then digital obviously can be used for testing and validation. So uh, capturing the the digital images or digital information about the the finished product and then comparing that to that original model, um, but even beyond production, uh, getting information about the the part in its life, uh, throughout its life, in its use, and then getting that feedback and comparing that again back to that digital twin. So, all of this sounds great, but it does create some some challenges, and there have been some barriers to really taking full advantage of this. Uh, the obvious one being, with all this digital information, there's a, a greater risk of data security, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, there's also a shift in where, um, you know, we talked about our, our, our Gary in the introduction talked about our continuous improvement background, and we've been focused on material flow, like from a lean or Toyota production system standpoint for a while. Um, and now we are focused also on making sure that we have data, complete and accurate technical data, and that is seamlessly exchanged. So we're focused on information flow. Um, in the same way we've been focused on material flow, um, requires different technology and different skill sets, but uh, that as more and more critical as, as companies adopt uh, digital or smart manufacturing. Um, significant challenges in uh, exchange of the data, interoperability, lack of standards. Um, we've heard been involved with uh, projects, we've heard stories that uh, the customer has a 3D model that is part of the technical data package, but the um, but then they say that's not the official document of record, and and the the, cust the supplier has to rely simply on 2D drawings and other metadata, which eliminates the the the, the possibility of the power of of utilizing those 3D models. So that's that's an example of some challenges that we've seen. Um, commercial companies can collaborate. It's a little bit challenging to um, uh, collaborate and take advantage of this in a DoD procurement environment. Um, and there's been some, in some cases, a lack of understanding, realizing digital manufacturing is, is far more than just going paper. Um, understand the true benefits, the technologies that are there, maybe adopting a scaled approach, uh, break it down to smaller chunks and focus on those areas where you've got problems or challenges where digital technology can help you solve them. So next slide. So, Industry 4.0 doesn't begin and end with the production of the part, but the larger opportunity is um, really this power of the connected network. Uh, over the left, you see the sort of linear approach of supply chain of uh, plan source, plan source make and deliver. Uh, but advanced digital technologies can allow us sort of to transform from this sequential repetitive uh, flow to more of a dynamic interconnected system. Uh, that can more readily incorporate all the partners. So Joe was talking about some of the visibility challenges. Well, taking advantage of digital supply network, we can get that more deeper visibility into the supply chain uh, with all partners and be sharing that um, information uh, in more of a comprehensive integrated method of, of managing the supply network. And then also harnessing those um, algorithms of, of and, and developed intelligence to be able to predict and respond better. Um, simplified version is we see more, we see it now, and we respond better. Um, thinking about our current situation, I don't know how many supply chains were considering the implications of a of a pandemic, um, but there were models to predict what that impact might be. And, um, and now those models are much more informed and can make much better decisions. And if we can take advantage of those uh, in, in a network like this, uh, then we can respond better to signals that we may have been missing before or just even ignoring before. So next slide. So obviously, again, I mentioned this before, if we're going to be sharing a lot more data, that's going to increase increase the risk of exposure to either attack or, or loss of data. Um, and that's significant impact on small to medium-sized businesses. The attacks on small to medium sized businesses are growing and the cost and impact to them uh, with, for example, the average ransomware attack is costing companies $133,000. Um, and that, that has been increasing over, over time. Um, 
also an implication of a national and economic security implications. I'm sure every one of you has seen this comparative picture between the US F-35 and China's J-31. Um, it is a matter of national security and, and we're recognizing that it's a financial loss as well. One stat that jumped out at me um, a couple of years ago in our work with uh, small and medium-sized businesses and cybersecurity was, is that China has developed an army of 180,000 and that's about the size of, I think, the U.S. Marine Corps. So we have a very dedicated and focused enemy. Um, the other impact from a supply chain perspective is that 80% of breaches originate in the supply chain and 45% were attributed to those past partners. So going back to Joe's comments about visibility, how critical that is for us to really manage risk of knowing who the supply chain partners are and then what the, what the risk cybersecurity. So next slide. So what's uh, about it? Uh, they are the government and they're here to help. Um, so I think a good bit of you have probably heard of the DFARS cyber rule or DFARS 252, 204-7012, and um, that relates to the NIST 800-171. It has been in place for uh, uh, several years. Uh, companies who handled transmitted or stored controlled unclassified information were to be um, uh, to have things in place by 2017. Uh, again, that's limited. That was limited to companies with CUI. It was a self-certification process, it is a self-certification process. And um, uh, the, the way that it was structured is companies, after they did their assessment, be working action plans uh, to implement some of the controls. Um, the newer model, which is coming on board this fall, um, and it'll be phased in over six years, uh, where NIST 800-171 was limited to suppliers with controlled and classified information, uh, this will impact all DOD contractors. Um, everyone will have to be certified to some level, uh, one through five of, of CMMC. And, um, and they will be required to be uh, certified through a third party certification board or audit auditing system auditors and uh, the requirement for that during that audit will be that they're fully implemented. So uh, if you think about NIST 800-171 equates to uh, almost to a level three of CMMC, there were 110 controls. There's 130 for level three. Um, all of those controls will need to be implemented um, at the time of, of the audit, as opposed to being able to continue to work a plan. Um, we certainly understand, you can go ahead and go to the next slide certainly understand that there's some questions about CMMC, how it's going to be rolled out, uh, some questions and challenges that the board is facing. Um, we don't, we haven't heard any yet of any delays, um, but in our discussions with small to medium sized businesses, when we look at the data, and this is data from our own asset working with um, small businesses on NIST, is the percentage of companies that had um, things in place for any of the controls was all below 50% of the ones that we've worked with over the over the last few years. There are significant gaps and which translates back to those risks that we talked about a few slides ago. Um, and you would expect gaps in things that took some resources or technology like multi-factor authentic authentication, you know, continuous monitoring, but even some basic um, um, IA was hit and miss as it related to the standard. Um, even some things that are that should already have been part of a, an operations system like media protection and physical protection were still um, uh, less than half the companies had had all those in place. Um, so our, our our discussions are go ahead and be planning whatever level of CMMC you think you're going to need because there's probably some gaps that you may not know about and uh, you need to be kind of moving toward. Next slide. So I do want to shift gears a little bit and uh, some of the uh, industrial-based challenges that we are seeing in, in the DOD. Um, this just references a, a recent study that was done and some of this information came from, from this study. Next slide. One of those um, areas is a decline in U.S. manufacturing capabilities. And, and Joe mentioned that, that there's a lot of drivers driving advanced manufacturing that's going to drive a, a shift in, in skills. But we still need the, the the manufacturing trade skills, the basic core manufacturing trade skills. They're they're both important. So, 
um, as a research education institution, uh, this is an area of focus for us. And it's not limited to those skilled, those skilled trades or skilled uh, degrees, like four year college or undergraduate degrees, four year undergraduate degrees or postgraduate degrees, but we're interested in how do we do education and workplace development differently? How do we work collaboratively with industry, with DOD institutes, with two year colleges, K through 12 and other organizations to have a more holistic, more non-traditional pro these challenges. And I'll talk more about that in a few slides. Next slide. So one area is just the gap in America's manufacturing workforce. Uh, manufacturing employment peaked in 1970, dropped um, from 79 to 2017, lost 7.9 million manufacturing jobs. Um, as 30% of the workforce. And while there's some positive trends in manufacturing, uh, we've had from, went from 4 trillion in output in 97 to nearly 2.2 .2 in 2017, um, the chart up here kind of reflects a more recent trend. And as you see, manufacturing job openings creeping up, but also it's a widening gap as manufacturers struggle to hire and retain skilled workers. And the result of that is uh, once he predicts that over half of the manufacturing jobs, 2.4 million, could be vacant by uh, 2028. That's pretty uh, astounding. Next slide. Another uh, area of focus uh, is in STEM education and trade skills. Again, we've mentioned this a couple of times. We need both. And what we're seeing is there's really a disparity in between STEM occupations and core manufacturing op occupations. Um, and in a 10 year period, STEM occupations experienced a large uh, job growth with 52% of those occupations seeing growth. In the same time period, 74% of manufacturing jobs um, of manufacturing occupations lost jobs. Uh, and this chart here, uh, if you compared these two, these both list the top 10 occupations that experience growth for STEM occupations and manufacturing occupations, those core manufacturing uh, jobs. And the, the combined top 10 of the top manufacturings that, was, that ex saw some growth in this time period were um, less than the top two in STEM. So there's quite a disparity in, in, in the growth in, in manufacturing jobs between STEM and uh, the core manufacturing. Next slide. One area of concern or other area of concern is uh, the, the demographic challenge. We're seeing a decrease in workers in age 35 to 44. They're leaving the workforce for other sectors. Um, and at the same time, that means we've got a greater risk of our workforce that is um, that is older, but is at risk of, of leaving in the near future. And so where we have these experienced people that are transitioning out of the workforce, um, it's be great to harness that that knowledge, but the uh, the age where people are most poised to internalize that knowledge and take over and become the more experienced, they're actually leaving the workforce, and there's less opportunity to do that. Next slide. So I just want to talk a little bit about some strategic approaches to consider and some things that we're um, engaged in. Uh, first thought is to engage the, the the emerging workforce system. So if you think about it, uh, over 40% of the work for work workers are now employed in some type of alternative work arrangement, um, whether it be part time or gig work or something like that. That's not as that's not the case in manufacturing, but opportunities to do that to take advantage of those types of work arrangements. Um, automation, you automation for low, lower skilled jobs that um, manufacturers can't fill and then use their existing workforce for power build or um, those those jobs that do require uniquely human skills. Um, tap into the retirement workforce, developing programs to retain and uh, get, capture that knowledge from the retiring workforce in-house training investment and also apprenticeship programs where you expose people to the skilled trades through apprenticeship um, and and start um, developing those programs back that we've had in the past but but have lost and then another one is taking advantage of private and public partnerships um, and some of those examples over to the to the right are are some things that uh, are examples of this for first of all the manufacturing institutes where um, ncdm and america makes are, are part of 
uh, the the American Makes being added to Manufacturing Institute, and one of their focuses is uh, creating the workforce and education roadmap, and and coming up with these uh, classroom based learning, instructor led labs, uh, maker spaces, and and how can industry partner with folks like America Makes to advance their workforce and and uh, uh, adopt the technology and that sort of stuff. Um, the second example is uh, uh, the U.S. Army. CCDC AFMIC, uh, which is we used to be MRDEC, uh, but they partner with a local uh, high school system to uh, provide programs to advance manufacturing technologies, including additive manufacturing, advanced machining, and robotics to high school students. So they they come in, they get into high school and even middle school started being expanded to, and create that interest at an early age. Uh, so they come out and have an interest in getting into manufacturing. And the last one there is uh, is FAME, which is uh, uh, the Federation of Advanced Manufacturing Education. It's a advanced manufacturing technician program. It's not limited to Alabama. This is just an example of Alabama's. Indiana has one as well, um, and it's it's a partnership between, um, in, in our case, two year colleges and industry. Toyota just be, happened to be one of the primary ones, but uh, these these students are working through getting a a two year degree or a certificate. And they're getting uh, experience and in some cases, even getting paid. And then when they get out, uh, they are the stuff that they're learning is directly applicable to the industries that have been working and partnering with the program. So they're the most skilled people to things and the jobs um, as they become available because they've been trained to meet the exact needs of, of industry. Um, and so we're, we're engaged in uh, this sort of effort. Uh, it just actually came out today. But we, um, uh, UAH and our, our consortium was designated a defense manufacturing community um, where we're going to be involved, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in promoting this advanced manufacturing and workforce education, manufacturing technology adoption uh, across uh, a region of, of the state. Uh, and it is, it's taken advantage of these private public partnerships to try to develop the workforce and advance the technology. Um, and create a different way of, of educating uh, our young folks and, and getting other people to enter uh, to new jobs into the manufacturing environment. So next slide. So that's it for me and, and us and ready for questions. Thank you guys. Thank you, Joe and Brian. I think we have time for one question. Um, so the question is, what issues or risks do you hear the most from small and medium manufacturers in the supply chain? And do those identified risks match up to the reality that you just went over, like the cyber and, and the workforce education? Wow. Um, I think cyber cybersecurity is probably one of the ones we hear about the most. Um, and meeting the challenges of that is certainly a Certainly, is a challenge for a small to medium sized manufacturer to make whatever investment and changes in their um, information systems to meet those requirements, and especially with the uh, uh, sometimes unknown uh, change in requirements from the NIST 800-171 to CMMC. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges. I think. Brian, I think. Yeah, I think uh, um, it, it really depends on the industry. When we're talking to um, industries, small to medium sized companies in like construction or folks that are relying on skilled trades, um, that's their their primary concern is getting the workforce to um, to to finding force to fill those jobs. Uh, and, and part of that is a, is is a I think it's an education standpoint of, uh, you know, for years we've told um, uh, and, and I was told this, that your best opportunity is to go to go to college. And, and that's really the only only choice you should really consider um, when there's huge opportunities in, in manufacturing skilled trades to start even earlier than it would take to get a college degree and be very. Um, and, and the way things are trending, those, those are longer lasting jobs. And part of it is just making sure that that we sort of change that paradigm and that shift. But it really depends on. Um, you know, if, if you're if you're relying on those skilled trades for us, our conversations is that's the biggest um, challenge. And it's interesting because there's industries that are willing to invest in apprenticeship programs or invest in partnerships. It's just, you know, somehow uh, getting the right people and right at the 
be able to to be able to do that. Great. Well, thank you, John Brian, for your time and your insights. We appreciate it. Uh, I'll turn the mic back over to Leslie or to Rachel to uh, introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Gary, and thank you to uh, our last two speakers. That was very informative. I appreciate that. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Jill Neidig. Uh, Jill Neidig uh, currently serves as a Director of Research and Development for ITMCO. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree from Bob Jones University in Operations Management, 14 years of experience in integrating manufacturing technology and software development. He sits on the technical advisor group for MT Connect, an open source royalty free standard that is intended to foster greater uh, inter interoper interoperability between devices and software applications. Uh, he has a long list of things that he's accomplished over the last few years. So I'm going to name a few of them. NIDIG also sits on the technical advisory committee for MXD, a federally funded research and development organization which encourages factories across America to deploy digital manufacturing and design technologies so those factories can become more efficient and cost competitive. His company was voted the 2014 Autodesk Inventor of the Year by Autodesk Community. He has been named as a manufacturing thought leader by IMTS Insider. He recently won second place in the MT Connect Challenge at the 2014 MC2 conference for his application, Expanding Manufacturing's Vision, MT Connect plus Google Class. Uh, a few more things, because I think it's good for uh, today's purpose. He has pre previously been the manufacturing keynote speaker at Autodesk University and recently presented at the Automotive Innovation Forum. He was the recipient of the SME's 2015 Outstanding Young Manufacturing Engineer of the Year Award. And uh, he is the CEO and co-founder of the Simba Chain, a blockchain as a service startup. He recently spoke at the White House by invitation of the National Economic Council in recognition of the progress that has been made by himself and his company in the Manufacturing USA program. Nidig is very involved in his advisory role at the ITM Co Manufacturing Education Center located at Plymouth High School, which was started by his company to prepare students for the challenges of careers in the manufacturing world. So that was only half of the story that I could tell about Mr. Joel Nidig. So Joel, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon, and we look forward to hearing from you. The stage is yours. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And uh, yeah, thanks, Gary, uh, for the introductions. And um, yeah, uh, I think it's a great, uh, thanks again for the, yeah, for reading the bio. And I think it's a great segue, um, you know, the gentleman from Alabama just uh, communicating the supply chain risk and capabilities that, you know, we have a lot of capabilities in the United States, but there's also obviously a lot of risks that we have, um, especially in our, you know, securing, um, you know, our nation's uh, ability to um, produce for you know national security. So, um, and it's interesting because um, yeah, my so my current company um, Simba Chain, our software company that ITAMCO started, um, was out of the University of Notre Dame, and we are actually building um, supply chain risk management, um, counterfeit and non-conforming. Um, uh, uh, you basically a platform to you know find and deep dive into these supplier networks and find these different things for um, DoD. So we have contracts with Navy, Air Force, uh, the Marines, and um, yeah. So it's really love to talk to you guys more. You know later on. So great talk. Um, I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, so I came close story. Um, I'll just um, I know I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to kind of breeze through everything and my slides are available. I can share them with Rachel and she can distribute them to everybody that's in attendance. Um, but um, so my grandfather and great uncle started ITM go back in 1955. And um, they worked for South Bend tool and die at the time before they started ITM co and decided to go out on their own. Um, but South Bend tool and die. Uh, it was kind of the age of Studebaker and um, uh, a lot of Bendix and, you know, there's a lot of uh, old, you know, World War II manufacturers, but they were in aerospace and automotive, if you remember Studebaker or Bendix. Um, so, uh, but they, that's where they came from. And um, my, uh, my uncle actually worked on the Manhattan Project. Um, some of the stuff in Tool and I was working on some of the components uh, that was part of the research for that. Um, so it's just kind of, you know, my roots go back pretty far. So I'm a third generation 
um, for ITMCO, but we've done a lot of startups and have, uh, and, and I'll get into some of those uh, coming up. Um, but uh, yeah, basically just, you know, traditional contract manufacturer. Um, let me click to my next slide here. Um, you know, our story just started off really humbly, 4,000 square foot. Um, my uncle um, had saved up, my great uncle had saved a bunch of money um, and my grandpa, um, both have passed away now, but um, my grandpa, you know, all his contribution was a typewriter to the company. You know, that's all he had. He came right out of college and, you know, had just been a machinist at South Bend Tool and Die, where my grand, where my uncle was 11 years older and had risen to, you know, executive level there. But we, uh, since then, we've got two locations now, uh, over half a million square feet of manufacturing floor space, floor space uh, 225 CNC machine tools. We have a tree farm, wetlands, uh, farmlands. Um, we build an at uh, for the we you know fund a manufacturing education center for our local high school because we're a small community of ten thousand people and we need to incubate our own um, machinists. So that's what we do. We actually um, train uh, all the way from junior high through high school, and then hopefully they come either work for a or one of the other. There's a lot of other local machine shops around. So. We're kind of like a little close knit community that you know tries to grow everything ourselves because it's hard to you know bring everybody from the outside. So we try to maintain that excellence. Um, so Plymouth's facility is hundred thousand square feet, mostly doing additive, and um, that's where all the research and development. Um, probably saw in the news we are we we have a phase two with the Air Force three uh, D printing uh, runway mats. Um, so there's a large project there that is undergoing um, with additive. Um, we have a, um, and that's with the Purdue University, uh, one of the, our partners. Um, then in Argus, Indiana, we are, that's 385,000 square feet. Um, you know, we can lift 110 ton lifting capacity. So really large assembly manufacturing, rail spur access. We go up to 160 inches in gear manufacturing. So we have large four meter uh, gear capacity. Um, so really big stuff down there. Um, so we, um, uh, you know, we started uh, our journey in the Department of Defense. We, we'd always done defense work and machining, but we started getting the software. And one of the ones we started, uh, we started building applications and a professor from the University of Notre Dame came to me and was like, hey, you guys got to start taking some of this stuff outside your company and doing startups and SBARs. And I'm like, what's an SBAR? I don't even know what that is. Um, and so we started, uh, you know, we built we built this encryption application um, that uh, could do peer to peer communications um, on, uh, on Apple. And then we um, we submitted uh, some work that we've done been doing with Notre Dame to DARPA, and then they funded a a, a cyber that um, basically was the first blockchain secure messaging platform, um, and it was uh, actually doing digital assets, MIPR, which is a military interdepartmental purchase request internal to uh, government agencies as they send money back and forth to uh, transact work um, between themselves. Um, and then we were sharing large files and um, Docker containers, and I won't get all the technical jargon of this. So, you know, why did we go to blockchain? Um, that was one of the big things that we, uh, started dove, dove, dove into four years ago. Um, and the reason is, is because everybody needs a way to balance. And uh, it's basically a ledger that everybody can share and see. But there's a way to, you know, from supply chain standpoint and a risk management standpoint, only share the data that you need and securely. Um, everything, every digital transaction in blockchain is digitally signed and encrypted. And so, um, you know, having that peer to peer communication just at the basis and the very foundation of, you know, everybody wants to add AI and machine learning and all this, you know, industry 4.0, IoT. But if you don't have a really solid, secure foundation about how these things are transacting at the, you know, the binary level, which is what blockchain is zeros and ones, um, that's really where you need it. And so that's why we set out to do a startup um, and, in, and develop SimbaChain. Um, and now we, uh, yeah, we have 12 million in government contracts and, and the rest is history. Um, so we, we really got into um, our first institute we joined was America Makes, and then we joined DMDI, which is MXD, 
Um, and then since then we've joined um, uh, Remade, we're part of ARM. Um, so we're part of all these, if you've in the, main, the, the Manufacturing USA Institutes, we're part of uh, SESME as well. So we're, we're very active from a small business side of things um, to be part of these. And my startups had actually joined, uh, you know, the startups that they spawned uh, had joined these. So Atlas 3D uh, joined America Makes once it was spun out, and I'll talk about that. Um, Simba is part of uh, MXD. Um, so, so it's kind of cool to see that this Manufacturing USA is actually building, uh, it's, it's creating jobs and making com building companies. Uh, and, you know, we wouldn't have the opportunity um, had it not been for this, um, you know, as a small business to be able to really have an opportunity to collaborate with such big universities and, and industrial partners. Um, so, yeah, I went to the White House in 2016, which was really exciting, spoke there on um, digital manufacturing and transformation. Um, and uh, that was a, that was really exciting. And actually, we're going back next year uh, after COVID, we were invited back um, for another event. So it's exciting to go back there and speak again. Um, the, so, you know, some of, I, I always look at it from a small business standpoint. That's just my nature because I'm just a little guy. But um, so like why small business innovation research? And, you know, I'm going to just talk quickly about like where to look, how to connect with universities, you know, don't self fund. You don't have there's there's the SBR program has a three billion dollar seed fund. So, you know, if you have that opportunity, it's a great place to interact. Um, project management um, ready to, you know, looking at how to get from A to B is really important. So ready to launch. Um, and then we can, I can answer any questions at the end. But um, the other thing, if you're an Indiana company, just FYI, you can get um, up to three grants matched up to fifty thousand dollars by um, by the uh, the uh, twenty twenty uh, first century fund, um, and Elevate Ventures mo uh, manages that. So uh, you know, if you're a small business and you win an SBAR, you need to go get those matching funds because it's just filling out like one online form and you get basically a non-dilutive $50,000. So that's a great thing that the state of Indiana has been promoting. Um, so they want to they want to invest after you win an award, they want to invest further, you know, give you more money into that. So I really encourage anybody that's looking to SBR to look into that. Um, find opportunities. Um, once again, SBR.gov has like every listing of every single agency. Um, if an agency is doing, I believe it's over like 500 million in spend or a billion dollars in spend, they have to be part of the um, uh, the SBR program. So that's pretty much every agency is is doing that. So um, there usually there always is a set aside for small business. And then the uh, there's large defense network to to commercialize and partner with that will provide you letter of supports. You know, Manufacturing USA, America Makes. I mean, there's a great amount of partners in there. And if you go to their TRXs and you go to the MMXs on the member meetings, it is, it's just like NDIA. It's, it's what, when you, it, it takes a little effort and costs a little money and a little bit of your time. But when you, the people you meet, you can collaborate with, you, you know, you never know where the, where those kind of relationships will lead. So university and partners, um, we have a lot. Um, Caterpillar was like our very first customer back in 1955, and we continue to do business with them for over 60 years. So um, we, um, you know, kind of uh, really just look at the full gamut of manufacturing. We're big into additive, um, but we also in the digital and like, you know, uh, MT Connect, we've been very uh, active in that. Um, I'm an SME member council, uh, so I, I'm very active in the Society of Manufacturing Engineers and always excited about NAMERC and the different papers and conf things, manufacturing papers that are, are rolled out there. Um, and then, um, you know, why 3D printing? We got into 3D printing um, really is actually America Makes. And so like before 2015, we had done some plastic printing and we had some maker bots and different things like that, just doing like tooling and different things for the, for our, for our job shop. Um, but we really uh, found that it, uh, it had a lot of promise, um, especially in just not in, um, not for tooling, but also for part manufacturing and building those out. So since then we've, uh, we have an, M, we have an EOS M290 and that's our 
kind of our, our big investment into additive, which is extremely expensive. And then the operation of it is too, but um, we do a lot of defense work and um, uh, stuff for NASA. Um, so a lot of, a lot of ability there. So we partnered with Johnson and Johnson and university of Pittsburgh and Notre Dame um, to uh, go after a project that was presented by America makes. And what we came out with was an automated software uh, to help um, a success of first article runs um, in additive because it's extremely complicated to get the supports right and the especially metal 3D printing. Um, and so we came out with this cloud software. Um, we won the uh, nationally competitive grant of 1.6 million. And then we ended up commercial, Atamco was the commercialized partner. So we took that, did a startup called Atlas 3D. And then just in 20, in November of 2019, it was acquired. So it was acquired by Siemens. Um, and so that was really exciting. So it was a win for, you know, all the companies and the universities that were involved. It was a win for America Makes. It uh, created um, multiple jobs um, and was, uh, um, you know, great thing for Indiana. Um, and, yeah, just all around, it just created a lot of um, uh, uh, opportunity and every, you know, things for everyone involved. Um, so it was really exciting to be part of that. And um, I'll, I'll leave you all with this. Um, I kind of breeze through the, through the presentation, but, um, you know, this is what I live by. So I, um, failure is not, is not the opposite of success. It's part of my success or of, of your success. So um, what I see people, I get in a lot of proposal writing and stuff like that. So I've written probably like, over 200 proposals um, between SBAR and Manufacturing USA and different things like that. And um, so I have to, you have to lose a lot to win a little and, but uh, the success is, you know, priceless, I think behind that. So, um, so I, th I just encourage everybody to, you know, partner and think about uh, not doing everything yourself, but seeing where you can add value between people. And, and that's where we've looked at, um, uh, really connecting with universities and and large industry and and that's um you know getting part of standards you know uh cmc cmmc was brought up and about nist 800 and and you know collaborating with the people that are involved in that um because it will help you um in the end especially if you're in if you're in defense work you're going to have to be compliant and so the more you get up to speed and understand what it the the items are for compliance it's better to uh, start it now than to, you know, wait till you, um, you know, the day you need to be compliant. So I just encourage you that. And there's the other cool thing is like Purdue MEP, if you're in Indiana, they'll come in and do an assessment and the state of Indiana will actually um, subsidize that, uh, that, that assessment. So um, there's, there's great opportunity there. So if you want to reach out to the Purdue MEP, um, you can Google that, and um, they're really nice to work with. We've done a lot of stuff with them at Tamco. They're doing our CMMC stuff uh, compliance. It does, it is grueling. I will not lie. Um, so, but it is uh, really important, especially for our national security, that we um, really take it um, and you know don't take it lightly. So, um, yeah. With that, um, you can always don't feel bad about contacting me. I love talking to people and just about technology all the time. Um, I never stop. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, our Twitter handle is at itamco underscore Facebook. Um, and then my emails right there. So thank you all. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Joel. Um, you have quite the story. So I appreciate your time this afternoon. A um, couple of questions that are coming in. Uh, we have time for, I think, one or two. So considering your company's humble beginnings and the growth of your family's business in Indiana, what is one, because you gave a few, but if you picked one point of advice for other small companies in Indiana looking to receive a bigger piece of the defense supply chain, what would that be? Um, uh, I would say university partnerships. I cannot put a value on the resources that they'll bring to you, um, especially when you're trying to submit on your first proposal. Um, they do it all the time. They know how government grants work and contracting. And if you can find a associate professor, so that's the level that you're looking for. You don't want a tenured professor. You want an associate professor that's looking, he needs a lot of wins and a lot of grants and he's hungry. 
Um, so look for an associate professor that wants to collaborate and they'll do a lot of the work um, and, and work with you um, on that proposal writing. And, um, you know, it's not, you might not win your first one or your second one or even your third one, but um, if you, um, you know, keep looking for those opportunities on SBR.gov and, uh, and then collaborate with somebody that's in that field and having that, um, you know, that person that's like a PhD in there um, is really exciting. So I would, yeah, universities are where it's at. Thank you, Joel. Um, another question that just came in, does blockchain hold promise to enable IP and data rights? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's what we're doing actually with Boeing and um, Navy and Air Force. Um, it's all that wrapped in there um, because we're, we're handling the bill of material, the, all the drawings that go with it, um, everything that ties back to which vendor we're tapping into, um, all the contracts that are involved. So we actually tap into FPDS. Um, we ingest all the, which is where the contracts, are the, all the contracts are listed. It's going to beta SAM, but, um, and then we have pub log and connectivity into guide up. Um, so are the non-conforming and quality uh, issues. So we query all that stuff and use AI and machine learning to determine. Um, and then we have a graph graphical query interface. So all that stuff in our, our backend is all blockchain. And we have connectivity into seven different blockchains. Uh, Simba does right now. So, um, so yeah, that's we we work hand in hand with the um, with the Department of Defense. This is what they're doing. They are building on blockchain. That is their goal to have all this connectivity to their suppliers on blockchain. Um, we wrote the defense paper, white paper for um, with Congressman Soto. Um, he's a congressman out of Florida, um, so you can Google him. But yeah, Simba is that. We wrote a lot of that white paper. Um, and um, we will have the, like, from Simba's standpoint, we're going to have the first authority to operate into um, the supply chain uh, for DOD. Um, so inside DOD, we'll have that. So it's a lot of um, a lot of work going into a lot of partners like Boeing are um we're working with University of Notre Dame. Um, so it's very exciting, but definitely intellectual property rights are, are going right in there because we're, we're doing all the cleanse and the um, everything that's in the contract. So we're using smart contracts for that and everything that's in the contract for, because that's what DOD lives and breathes by, um, all that's going into there. So thank you, that was a great question. Thank you, Joel. Um, I want to take just one more minute. If there are any other questions, uh, we'll be happy to take questions via the chat box for either Joe Paxton, Brian Tucker, or Joe, uh, Joel Neidig. So now is your chance. If there are any final questions that you might have, and I'll give that about 30 seconds to see if any come in. Okay, well, I would like to end today's call by again, thanking everybody for being on the call this afternoon. Um, I wanna thank Gary Flegel again for the partnership with NDIA Indiana. I also wanna thank Joe Paxton and Brian Tucker and also Joel Neidig for being presenters this afternoon on the supply chain. Uh, NDIA Indiana will continue this partnership with Gary and his team. And as we move forward here shortly, you'll be receiving some additional information about the upcoming event in September. We look forward to hosting you again um, moving forward. And thank you all for being a part of this afternoon's call. Have a wonderful afternoon. and. Uh